All right, well, I guess we'll get started. If you guys have any questions, given the uh, nature of the small audience, you're welcome to stop me. Um, so this presentation is on a library called uh, Django Salesforce. It's a, it's a library meant to integrate um, the Salesforce API with the Django ORM. So you're able to actually perform Django style queries against Salesforce uh, using the same syntax. So first I'd like to give a nod to the author and maintainer of the Django Salesforce library. It's a small library. These guys do a lot of work, regular updates. So I just wanted to make sure that they were properly acknowledged given I'm presenting on their library. So the main reason to use this library as opposed to any of the other Salesforce integrations that are out there is, is it's smooth integration with Django. If you're very familiar with Django's way of, perform of managing objects, then this should be second nature to you. It also minimizes the amount of additional code that you'll have to write uh, if you just need a minor integration. Um, if you're familiar with Sales, are you, either you guys familiar with Salesforce? Yeah. So you're probably aware that um, the Salesforce um, SOQL is not exactly SQL, much like uh, their Apex language isn't exactly Java. There's always these little catch catch-ems that you got to be careful of. So the library automatically does the heavy lifting for you without having to necessarily work and worrying about formulating the query appropriately. Um, I actually wrote a patch for Django Salesforce about a year ago where they were implementing the range query filter and it was passing through the normal Django SQL conversion but SOQL doesn't recognize the between operator. So I had to rename it to use less than equal and greater than equal instead of just between. So um, I'm gonna get into some of the downsides of the library. So I talk about the usefulness of syncing the data as opposed to just using it for a live poll. Um, if you have a small application, it's okay to get away with doing a live poll, but I'll talk a little bit more about why you'd probably want to avoid that above anything but the most trivial of projects. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cut into a code example. So I have a small Django application and I'll tweet out the uh, GitHub rep uh, repo for the example if you're interested in looking at it more. So I have a just a basic application with a leads app and the purpose of this app is to talk to the leads uh, section of um, Salesforce. So if I look at my models, and I'll zoom out a little bit, if it's gonna let me. Oh. There we go. So if you're familiar with Django, you can see that the uh, method for creating objects is the same. Uh, however, there's no actual database behind this. The library is just passing this straight through and converting it into a Salesforce query. So if I'm interested in the last name of the lead that I'm looking up, I just define it as a character field with a max length. Now on my slides, I indicate that if you, you can write your own model names or uh, model attributes, uh, depending on how you'd like it to implement it, but you can just use the default Salesforce, Django Salesforce method if you use the inspect database command, it will dump out every field and every object in Salesforce. And then you can just copy paste and pick and choose which ones you like. And it will even include the custom fields that you create for your own individual deployment. Uh, the important thing is that if you do not use the uh, generated attribute name from Django Salesforce, that you define the DB column parameter when you're defining the attribute. So there's some disadvantages to doing it this way. So it's slow and I have a slide that it will show you. I had some new, I ran some new relic performance tests. The reason for this is if you're doing anything, if you're querying for an object with anything that has more than a handful of attributes, it's one large query and it's gonna hit, it's gonna hit Salesforce takes time for Salesforce to process, takes time for it to return, takes time for Django to process and then return it to the end user. So my primary, I primarily advocate for uh, 
using this asynchronously. So maybe a few times a day, you'll go out to Salesforce, you'll query the relevant data and bring it into a local database. Uh, again, um, the Salesforce object query language is not straight SQL. It's important to be aware of some of the minor trip ups. Django Salesforce abstracts a lot of this out for you, but if you're gonna drop down to raw or extra, then you're probably gonna be in trouble. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend you, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, there's also some uh, features for the select command that are not supported. Um, wild cards uh, for obvious reasons because you can get quite a large object in return. Um, calculation expressions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of using this library, um, if you uh, go through the documentation in terms of how to actually set it up, uh, it requests that you use a Django, I'm sorry, a Salesforce account where you create the user in Salesforce, uh, you specify the appropriate permissions, and then you utilize that account. Um, there's some murkiness as it relates to, well, if I expose this application to everybody in the world and they're actually doing live Salesforce updates from it, am I evading the Salesforce license? So there's some thought that needs to be put into that. Um, in addition, I have one client that I use this for, and they refuse to turn off 90-day mandatory password reset. So every 90 days, I have to go into this application and update the password. So um, Django Salesforce also has an OAuth 2 authentication scheme, working with the, new sale, the newer Salesforce OAuth 2 authentication scheme, but it's experimental. So I wouldn't necessarily advise using it in production. And finally, for those of you who've used Salesforce for quite a while, the default API query limit is 15,000 in 24 hours. Ask me how I know. <laughs> um, it's easy to fall into the trap if you are experimenting or doing something on production and you run into a large object set to hit that limit relatively quickly. So um, I really recommend, like with everything else, that you set up a sandbox environment for Salesforce, test out everything as best you can, import some live data into it. That way, if you're doing a lead.objects.all query, you don't wind up with 15,000 objects. So speaking to the speed, this, was, this is some new, uh, new Relic um, screenshot that I took for a small application that I wrote that all it was doing was displaying uh, call activity information. And you can see that the main time suck for was the requests out to Salesforce. And to return, I believe this was roughly 10 or 20 objects. It was almost a full second just to get that back into the Django application. So again, I recommend storing the data and querying it asynchronously in anything but the smallest of use cases. So I will actually show you, I have in the example application that I wrote, how easy it is to just quickly get something up and running and append it to your application. So um, I attended a talk, it was two talks ago, on a gentleman who had done a lot of Salesforce integration with his Plone application. Um, this might be useful if you want to give a small section to your power users to be able to create data in Salesforce, but without having to have the user go through the training and the headache of learning the whole Salesforce environment. So all this is is a basic CRUD application, create, read, update, delete. This is my list view, and you can see really quickly how easy it is. Just a standard form, presentation, lead, and it stores it right in Salesforce. I don't have Salesforce up on this computer right now. If you were to go into Salesforce, you'd see under recent activity, brand new lead created. Um, your, if you do some Salesforce side programming, you could use that as well to kick off some automation. The Django Salesforce library doesn't provide much in the way of automation. Um, so you can either use another library that I'll talk about briefly, or you can write the code in Salesforce itself using something like Apex. And if we go back to the list view, 
can see that it appears. This is direct query from Salesforce. And I can either edit this or I can just delete it right from here. Obviously, be careful with permissions. If I am not careful with my Django application, now I've given somebody the ability to delete materials out of Salesforce without necessarily the appropriate security controls. You can apply security logic to the account that Django Salesforce uses in order to restrict them from accidentally deleting something that they're not supposed to be able to. So for example, if you want them to be able to manage leads but not contacts, you can set up the permissions to be that granular on the Salesforce side. The important thing to remember when also using Django Salesforce is to mi minimize the number of attributes that you specify on the object to be the minimum that you actually need. So a lot of us, we will grab a handful of things, first name, last name, email, company name, mobile phone, other phone, blah, 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 all the way down the line. If you're not actually using editing or displaying mobile phone elsewhere in the application, remove it from your models because then it will always become part of the query out to Salesforce if you do a, gen a general filter statement. So it's important to minimize the amount of attributes that you have just to what you need. And if you don't pound on this, you're gonna be okay. If you do large, large queries in rapid succession, it's gonna be slow. So again, asynchronous data. Now there's some other ways that you can integrate Salesforce with Django. Um, and I'm pretty sure both of these will work with uh, Plone as well. Um, there's the old fashioned way, just write it in the request library, query the Salesforce API directly. You can become familiar with their documentation. Uh, if you're not a full-time Salesforce developer, I probably wouldn't advise it unless you really need that kind of specific access. Um, the Beatbox library is pretty good. Salesforce provides two different APIs, the REST API, which is what a lot of us are kind of moving towards, and the SOAP API, which is um, more for historical stuff. But what's important is that the SOAP API provides a way to do automation. So for example, converting a lead to an account, uh, you can, I don't believe you can, st I still believe you cannot do that through the REST API. So if you want that kind of automation, I'd recommend using Beatbox. Uh, there's also the simple Salesforce library, which provides functionality similar to Django Salesforce, but it doesn't use the Django RRM. It's um, a specific uh, method of querying the database that abstracts, I'm sorry, that queries Salesforce while abstracting away a lot of the particulars related to the UR, UR, uh, URIs. Any questions on anything that I covered? One of the things that I think about a lot um, when building things that integrate with Salesforce is the limitation of uh, how many API requests you can use per day in Salesforce. Yep. Yep. So um, that again comes back to doing uh, asynchronous behavior. So if you do need to expose this uh, data to some to an unknown population, an end population where you don't know how high it's going to be, I would recommend uh, policing the data uh, using maybe like Celery, querying Salesforce, bringing it down into a local database, and then serving the data from there. Um, you can based on the number of queries that you'll need to perform, you can uh, tune the frequency of the asynchronous tasks based on your needs. Any other questions? Okay, well, um, I was asked to put up the feedback for uh, the Six Feet Up app. Um, appreciate it if you give me any kind of feedback on my presentation, and if you're interested in reaching me, uh, my company is Plum Development. We're based out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and we are a uh, digital design company speci specializing in custom web, mobile, and software applications uh, for companies working with companies in the Northeast. Um, and I'm available on GitHub or Twitter at Bill is Plum. Um, please reach out. Thank you very much. <laughs>